we've been doing this uh, theme during the month of June. I've been talking about beyond positive thinking. And we're doing that because, you may have heard a little earlier in the, in the service, Unity has become known for our positive approach to life in general and spirituality. And it's a big part of our mission statement, which we shared a little bit earlier. We are advancing a positive message that teaches people of all ages and all faiths how to thrive in a changing world. A positive message can be powerful, but it's not just about positive thinking. We don't just put on our rose-colored glasses and go out into the world and call everything good. You know what that is. That's what we call metaphysical malpractice. A truly positive approach to life requires that we uh, live in right relationship to this thing we call reality, regardless of how we feel about it, because uh, life isn't always pleasant. Life is frequently painful. So how do we deal with that reality without becoming angry, upset, cynical, all of those things that can happen. A positive approach to life means we identify and focus on the things that support human flourishing. And then we maintain our focus on those things because we all know that whatever we focus upon is going to grow. We ask an all-important question. How then shall we live? What is it that makes for a truly good life? Now, some of you might recall, a few years ago, the news media was buzzing over some billboards that started popping up around the country, including several that were up in the Sacramento area. Anyone remember seeing this on billboards in the area? Mm -hmm. Are you good without God? Millions are. This was an ad campaign that was uh, launched by various humanist organizations. The billboard is a, is a shorthand way of asking this question. Do you have to be religious? Or do you have to believe in a certain kind of supernatural God in order to be a good and ethical person? Do you have to believe that this God establishes priests and imams and rabbis and other people who have been given divine authority to tell us how we're supposed to live. There are religious people who believe that we as human beings, we need the threat of divine judgment and punishment and hellfire in order to be good. If we didn't have those threats, well, we'd be terrible, terrible people. The world would be so much worse off than it is, according to some people. So, let, let's take a, and this is a very informal poll here this morning. Let me ask you this question. If I were to be able to conclusively prove, without any question, that there is no such thing as a judgment day, there's no such thing as hell and damnation, a show of hands here. How many of you would go out on a killing and stealing spree the next day? <laughs> okay, the, the camera's pointing at me, so it isn't capturing the audience. I just want to say for the folks who are watching this on video that we got about half the people with their hands up here, which isn't, which isn't too bad, really. <laughs> no, seriously, nobody has their hands raised. It's a ridiculous question, isn't it? It's a ridiculous, it's a ridiculous question. Most normal human beings have evolved to the point where we don't need that kind of reward and punishment system in order to be good and ethical people. And the key word in all of that is evolved. There was a time in human history where the only thing that mattered was survival at all costs. You did whatever you had to do in order to survive you did whatever you had to do to guarantee the survival of not just yourself, but your family unit. And then, as people started coming together in larger groups beyond just the family, tribes and clans and whatever you want to call them, something interesting happened. 
Anthropologists are discovering that in hunter-gatherer societies, they didn't need anything like a threat of heaven or hell to keep people in line. Life itself, reality itself, reflected back to them everything that they needed to do what was good for both the individual and the group. We somehow instinctively knew what was good for the individual and what was good for the tribe. And what was good for everyone in the tribe was conversely also good for the individuals. That's how it worked out. There are even some animal species that have learned how to behave this way. So think of it. Even before there was any such thing as written language, there was already this ancient form of the golden rule that people somehow knew about instinctively. They lived it. Then when the written word comes along, we can find different versions of the golden rule in just about every culture and spiritual tradition in the world. This is something we need to remind ourselves of every so often. We can go from the oldest even to the most recent and see it. So here's a review, starting with the Hindu tradition, the oldest that we know of right now. In the Hindu tradition, they say this is the sum of duty. Do not do to others what would cause pain if done to you. Next we have Buddhism. A state that is not pleasing or delightful to me, how could I inflict that upon another? Or another version, hurt not others in ways that you yourself would find hurtful. Taoism from ancient China. The sage has no interest of his own, but <clears throat> takes the interests of the people as his own. He is kind to the kind, he is also kind to the unkind, for virtue is kind. He is faithful to the faithful, he is also faithful to the unfaithful, for virtue is faithful. Confucianism. Se Kung asked, is there one word that can serve as a principle of conduct for life? And Confucius replied, it is the word shu, reciprocity. Do not impose on others what you yourself do not desire. Judaism. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself, or what is hateful to you, do not, do not to your fellow man. This is the law. All the rest is commentary. <laughs> and of course, Christianity, we know this one. In everything, do to others as you would have them do to you, for this is the law and the prophets. And finally, from Islam, not from the Quran, but from the Hadith. It says, none of you truly believes until he wishes for his brother what he wishes for himself. So there it is, a neat summary, pretty much circling the globe. It's rather impressive, actually, because how do you explain the same basic idea arising in all of these different cultures so long ago, and we've talked about how the same thing can happen with, with mythology and symbolism. You see mythology and symbolism repeated across far-flung cultures who had no means of communication. They come up with some very similar stories, similar themes and things like that. How does that happen? A religious person would say, God. That's how it happens. They'd give credit to God. They would say, human beings couldn't possibly come up with an idea like the golden rule without supernatural divine intervention, unless God put it into their heads. Okay, so then the question becomes, which God? It's a good question, isn't it? Which God? Once we get beyond the golden rule, the religions and the spiritual traditions of the world are all over the place when it comes to defining what else it might take in order to be considered to be a good person. Everyone has a different set of rules. In one religion, God requires males to be circumcised. In another religion, God requires people to believe that Jesus is the Son of God born of a virgin. Then there's the religion where God requires that people pray five times a day facing to the east. Two of those religions, by the way, both agree, don't eat pork. Those same two religions disagree on shellfish. One says shellfish is fine, the other one says no lobster for you. <laughs> and that's just scratching the surface. Hundreds of religions throughout history, every one of them has their own set of rules. Even the religions like Buddhism and, and Taoism that don't have an official God concept, they differ. They all have these different rules and different ideas. And, and you know what? They can't all 
be right, but they can all be wrong. Somehow they got the golden rule, but beyond that, look what's happened. They have all these different rules and ideas about how to be a good person. Couldn't just settle for the golden rule. No, they had to have all these other different rules about how to be a good person, and then they fight over it. Space aliens looking at the Earth blowing up, and they're saying to each other, as near as I can tell, they're fighting over which religion is the most peaceful. <laughs> it's happening. It has happened. Bloody... Wars being fought over differences of religious opinion and nobody sitting down and thinking that maybe we're all wrong. Humankind evolved to this wonderful point of creating the golden rule thousands of years ago and then we proceed to ignore our own collective wisdom. It's remarkable. Looks like we have a little more evolving to do. Certainly at the level of consciousness because that's where it all starts. I've uh, talked about Barbara Marks Hubbard before. She's a well-known author on the subject of conscious evolution. She tells us this. One of the big messages we get from the universe is evolve or die. That's a fact. One of the gifts of being human is that, unlike, unlike dinosaurs, we can learn to evolve. We can exercise a degree of control over our evolution. We can take responsibility for the ongoing evolution of our own consciousness. We can change the way we think, which means that we can change our destiny. That's one of the amazing things about being born human. So let's look at the golden rule again. And uh, let's use the, the version that we see in the Hebrew scriptures, the very simple and elegant one that says, love your neighbor as yourself. Love your neighbor as yourself. I think the problem is in how we define the word neighbor. And every other version of the golden rule runs into the same problem. The golden rule may be ancient, but so far we've managed to apply it in a very narrow and limited way. Who is my neighbor? Who is my brother? That ain't heavy, right? Who is the other? Who is the neighbor? Who is the brother? Who is the other who I am to do unto? Everything lies in how we define that word. Everything, everything depends on how big our circle of caring and compassion is. If we define other as the people who are outside of our immediate circle, people who look like me, people who talk like me, people who believe sort of the same things that I believe, if everybody outside that circle isn't my neighbor, isn't my brother, and gets labeled as other in a way that sets up separation, we've missed it. We've missed a chance to evolve. People outside the circle get considered to be suspicious, or even an enemy, or an infidel, as the word is sometimes used. Consider what happened Two weeks ago, hard, hard to believe, two weeks ago today in Orlando, that was the polar opposite of the golden rule. And, and people who I respect have been twisting themselves into pretzels trying to argue that religion had nothing to do with it. The shooter was just crazy or conflicted about his own sexuality and so on. Well, yes, there's evidence for that. but. If you're looking for that polarizing force that can tend to cement our prejudices and turn them into anger and hatred, that can drive people to ignore the golden rule and commit atrocities like that, there's no greater negative force than religion. And nobody gets off the hook. Christianity, Islam, and Judaism have well-developed traditions of hatred, demonization, and exclusion directed at a variety of minorities, not just the LGBT community. I hear stories today about what happens when an ultra-Orthodox Jewish man gets on a plane and finds that there's a woman in the seat next to him. Guess who has to get up and move? Still today. They all have a religious identity. How can they do those things and at the same time 
talk about the golden rule at their church services or whatever it is that they do with their gatherings. Well, the problem, if you can call it that, or the, the, the situation is that we all evolve at different rates. Every religion has people who are at different evolutionary stages. The great spiritual teachers, the ones who lived hundreds and even thousands of years ago, the ones who gave us those versions of the golden rule that we talked about, well, they were a few light years ahead of the rest of the world on that evolutionary trail. This idea of evolution of consciousness, or call it conscious evolution, it really is a, a, a core teaching in unity. And it's the same thing that our great wisdom teachers have been trying to get across to us. We can learn how to evolve, which means we don't have to follow the dinosaurs into the proverbial tar pit. We have an option. I would suggest that the golden rule isn't the product of religion. It's a part of human universal consciousness, which in turn flows from universal principle. That which is the, the, the source, the cause and essence of all that is. The same principle was responsible for the origin and evolution of biological life, which finally achieves this mysterious thing we call self-reflective consciousness. And after that, human survival depends on learning how to get along. Consciousness evolves, that leads to empathy, compassion, cooperation, seeing self and other as one. That's principle at work. Nothing wrong with the golden rule, we just haven't learned how to apply it to its full potential yet. And we can learn how to do it. We can learn to evolve, and we're the ones who have to change the way we think when we hear the word neighbor or brother, or sister. We're the ones who have to include a larger group of people when we hear the word community. Our circle has to keep growing. People tell me that they like to go home after our Sunday gathering with a, with a how-to, which is, which is certainly useful, but I think today we might agree we already know how to do this, don't we? We already know how to do this. We already know how to make the golden rule a reality. There's a, there's a legend about Socrates, the, the great Greek philosopher. Someone comes up to him one day in Athens and asks him this question. He says, what's the best way to get to Mount Olympus? Socrates replied, by making sure every step you take is in that direction. <laughs> there you go. Every step you take, every time a thought comes up that requires you to consider who's my neighbor, who's my community, what do I think of them over there, every step has to be taken in the direction of expanding that circle. There is no other who is outside of that definition of the golden rule, and that's just the starting point. The journey isn't complete yet because it goes on and on, step by step by step. So. Make sure every step we take leads in that direction. Or as the folks at Nike would say, just do it. <laughs> See you next week. Yeah. Thank you.